things. And the main reason why I uh, put it, uh, an email out to you to reach out and try and get in contact with you today or over the last couple of weeks was mainly to do with uh, talking about the golf swing, but also how people are applying the golf swing in the gym and kind of taking the, the range to the gym where lots of people would be practicing different types of activities in the gym not necessarily is it the right stuff for them or wh however it is they, they may have plans they may not have but it's mainly to it creating some nice uh, simple awareness around that activity so before we get into that anyway um corkman living in uh, los angeles tell us a little about yourself and how you got there yeah so my name is mike carl I am a strength and conditioning coach, which is basically a physical trainer who specializes in the preparation of athletes for different sports. For about the last five years, I've been solely focusing on golfers. Before that, I did a lot of work in GA, uh, particularly with teams in Cork, and some athletes and teams from a variety of other sports. I got a job opportunity in uh, Irvine, California, via my TPI education, basically. Um, I just saw a tweet one day that a place called Hanson Fitness for Golf was looking for a strength and conditioning coach. I was uh, recently out of college um, was working a lot with golfers and thought that that would be a really good opportunity to work with golfers full time. Uh, so moved to California in October of 2016. So I'm here just over four years now. Um, when I was in Ireland, I was working under a kind of brand called Fit for Golf. And when I came here, I didn't want to let that kind of slip while I was um, working under another gym, basically. So I kept the Fit for Golf stuff going in an online capacity. So a lot of stuff on my website and on my social media pages and kind of developed that into an online business really where i made training material available through a, a via the via the fit for golf app and that is kind of where i suppose most people who know the fit for golf brand name or know me would have come across me is via those platforms um so my time here has been split between working in in the gym for hansen fitness for golf in the last kind of two years or so, the time has swayed towards I've been doing less in the gym and more for myself. And that kind of multiplied by about 10 this year with the COVID, obviously. There was there was very little gym training going on. And kind of because of COVID too, um, when the PGA Tour and the European Tour shut down this year, luckily I had a decent kind of following built up online and had sort of a lot of I suppose material and testimonials and things like that out from golfers so just just uh, at the beginning or kind of a quarter of the way through 2020 I started working with quite a few players on the PGA and European tour some players on the champions tour the corn ferry tour the Canadian tour um because golf tournaments were stopped and players realized they had this huge period where they could kind of delve into more physical training that they couldn't do in the past, but didn't really know what to do. So that's kind of what my time has been, has been made up of recently is, is primarily material for the app, for the general public, the kind of promotional and educational material online, and then working a little bit more closely with the tour players and traveling to some tournaments, which I did this year. Excellent. That sounds fantastic, Mike. Well done there. Excellent. And um, from from your perspective there, from let's say the practicing methodology that people might have uh, from the gym or the range, and bringing either either that type of methodology to the gym, meaning let's say if someone's practicing different types of activities, and just let's say they, they say they decide I'm focusing, to, I'm going to focus total on improving my uh, my uh, golf game or golf swing from gym alone and um, when you kind of compare that i kind of get a bit uh, when you can kind of compare the gym alone stuff to the practice ground and um, what would you find uh, um, are the key differences between both 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and a sort of very interesting area. I think when you first got in contact with me and asked a couple of questions was, I put out a tweet um, talking about how practicing your golf swing in the gym with, you know, different weighted implements, whether it's a ball or a band or a weighted, you know, bar or something like that is not really the same as practicing your golf swing on the range. And it's also potentially not really doing anything to improve your physical capabilities. And what I meant by that is a lot of people, when they hear the term golf fitness, or to be honest, even a lot of sort of training programs or exercises that are prescribed by people who are trying to help golfers, I think in my opinion, they fall into this sort of gray area where it's not that they're necessarily bad things to be doing, but I just don't think they're particularly efficient. I think that people can get sort of stuck practicing movements that aren't really similar enough to the golf swing or don't really demand any of the sort of, let's say, timing or skill or coordination elements that hitting a golf ball does. But they're also not loaded or they're not carried out at a speed that is going to be either heavy enough or fast enough to affect any physical characteristics like strength or power. I'm not saying that you can't do exercises in the gym that may make you aware of a particular type of movement or feeling that you're trying to create in your golf swing. There's no question that that can be done. I do it myself all the time. And I, I know lots of really good players who do, but it's just realizing that you can't change a, let's say, deeply ingrained swing pattern in the gym not possible like you can't go from practicing a let's just say a different type of turn in the gym or a different type of arm movement and then expect that to show up when you're hitting a real shot on the golf course like there's no way that that movement in a gym with no uh let's say outcome of the shot or sorry no worries about the outcome of the shot no club in your hands no ball no different let's say stance or lie is going to transfer to you hitting a shot on the golf course. Now, it may be useful in the very initial stages of somebody who doesn't understand. Let's say if, you're, if you've given someone a lesson, and let's just say a simple one is use, and it's probably common in, in kind of mid or higher handicappers. Let's just say that you're coaching somebody who has a big over-the-top move, right? A common yeah. move for, let's say, the 18 handicapper and they have a big slice. It's pretty easy to give somebody an exercise in the gym with either a band or a cable or a medicine ball or something like that. That makes it really easy for them to feel the opposite of an over the top move or at least a more say neutral move. But it's very difficult to then go straight to hitting golf balls and expect that move to show up because they're such different activities and that person has spent so much time developing the motor program of this big over the top move, the big left path, and then probably a big, you know, either uh, usually either a pull left or a big slice right, depending yeah. on, on where the club face is pointing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and those, let's just say those moves that somebody might have been working on, it's likely to have been something that is quite slow and exaggerated and not really done with a whole lot of, of force production. And from my point of view, that's also not really going to be doing anything to improve their muscle mass, their muscle strength, their muscle power. And that's why I mean that it's kind of somewhere in the gray area. So I think most people, if they're trying to basically look at ways to improve, mo most people who come to me for help they're already like they're obviously interested in improving their golf because they've looked at someone who's kind of help are trying to help golfers and they're also interested in improving their physical capacity. So I think that they just need to be a little bit kind of more aware that the stuff you're doing in the gym is pretty general in nature for the most part, in my opinion. You can absolutely prescribe drills like we talked about that might help with swing feels and things like that. Yeah. But I just think it's a pretty inefficient use of your gym, gym time, unless it's a very small percentage of it. Do your technique work, 
on the on the range or on the golf course or hitting into a net or wherever you practice and use your gym time to improve your physical capabilities like mobility like strength like power you might have some specific limitations in your body uh, in terms of mobility or strength that are feeding into the kind of tendencies you have in your swing but I still think that working on those should be a pretty small part of your, let's say, physical work. And that's mostly going to be general stuff. So things that don't look like the golf swing being performed in the gym can be extremely beneficial for golfers because they're being done at a high enough force production. There's either enough weight that's resisting the person or they're moving fast enough where it's making them stronger or it's making them more powerful. And then use your your practice time to work on the swing technique stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense from the point of view, certainly, is that uh, we're at different stages of the game, whether you're beginning an intermediate or, let's say, at, a, at a, an expert level, there's... Uh, there's certainly, as, as you're identifying with there, we all have swing deficiencies, which is just the nature of the game. Uh, deficiencies yeah. based on what we want to be perfect. <laughs> yeah, um, our ten tendencies at least is probably i think a, a good word for them because a lot of the time there's like there's some of the best players that have played have what some instructors or textbooks would label as uh, swing flaws but but clearly you know they can be worked around and there's there's ways of of playing exceptional golf oh with, absolutely with idiosyncrasies Yes, indeed. We, I mean, because we, we've all natural things. Everybody's swing is slightly different. It's a variation because we're all slightly different. Yeah. And, and whatever that may, might be is fine. Uh, the part uh, I suppose there is, is getting at would be identifying where you are, what you're trying to do, and the the the, the balance between what uh, physical exercises that would benefit what you're trying to do on, on the course. So yeah. Uh, I know I, I I I do I do I do I, I do because it's certainly the the the, the part about the the physical uh, activity and fitness activity and strength and training activity is a big part of the jigsaw for improving, particularly as you say the efficiency of your swing because if you have for example one part of the body is a little bit weaker on your left or your right that may be the that that may be a consideration for. Um, endurance during the game when your body gets a bit tired you start to get these kind of high and rights and low and lefts and you get these kind of crazy swings and then it kind of affects your mindset as well to think that I'm choking to death or there's yeah. <laughs> things going on like that I haven't got enough Mars bars into me or something like that you know yeah. <laughs> and uh, but when you well, because when you have something that's refined and well balanced I mean the repetition that you'd see from different people can be quite effective and, and it, with good repetition and a fairly decent uh, club face and impact your bad shots go particularly straight even though they might be hit very well they go straight if everything's going straight typically you're okay it's when yeah. the, it's it's the destructive shots that go like as you as you're saying high and right low and left but identifying what those are and the as you get into it what would you find then the the uh, uh, let's say reason uh, from from the different types of golfers that you're dealing with uh, if we took an example between uh we'd say if we took the handicap ranges between something between 15 to 20 and from let's say uh we'd say zero to six being expert level we say or even lower than that yeah what would you be? What would you find would be the main differences in in the the gym activity based on the types of stuff that you'd come across? When you're dealing with a player that is say, when you're dealing with a player that's a higher handicapper, like obviously you can have you could have a fifteen to twenty handicap who are two players who are of vastly different physical capabilities. You know, you might have someone who's an exceptional athlete. They might be a professional athlete in another sport but they're just very new to golf. Um, or you might have someone, if we just use the 15 to 20 handicapper, let's just say you're 50 year old male or female who you know works, let's say kind of eight hours a day at a desk, drives half an hour to and from work. Usually with the males, what you see is that they're limited in mobility, particularly in, I would say hip or pelvis mobility. So the ability for their hips to rotate 
They're limited in spinal flexion and extension, which basically means how much that their, their spine can round and how much their spine can extend. They're also limited in thoracic or let's say rib cage rotation, which is what most people would call shoulder turn, but that's not really your shoulders turning. That's actually your, your torso or your rib cage turning as such. Um, and they're also generally limited in something called shoulder flexion, which is raising your arm directly overhead, which is very important on the lead arm in the backswing. So if you think of your left arm uh, for a right-hander, they would be the main ones. When you look at, let's say, an elite player, a scratch handicap, or especially like a plus or a professional golfer, generally they don't have the same mobility issues. And you can almost see that or, or know that without assessing them. The reason being is you can look at their golf swing. Like if, if you look at Dustin Johnson's golf swing or Colin Marikawa's golf swing or even somebody who's not as powerful but is still exceptionally good, let's just say someone like Ian Poulter, you can almost tell from the way that they swing the club, they don't have mobility restrictions as such because if they did they wouldn't they wouldn't look like they do when they're swinging the club you'd probably see some of the things that the more uh, you know sedentary player and the higher handicapper has so with the higher handicap who is limited in mobility and doesn't have a particularly let's say good concept of the body movements that happen in the golf swing, if we call them, say, global movements, as opposed to the finer, more controlled movements, which would be more like the wrist angles and the club face angles, I think you can do a lot with the higher handicapper or beginner in a gym setting with some of the exercises that I talked about earlier in terms of practicing what a setup position feels, a basic rotation in a backswing feels like, a weight shift, and then more of, let's say, an extension or follow through through impact. I think you could actually help the golf swing of a beginner a lot with gym type exercises because they don't have a good concept of the general body movements that happen when the swing, when the swing occurs. So those things like medicine ball throws, maybe some of, you know, you've seen people doing the uh, like bar across their chest or the stick yep. across their chest, practicing some pivot moves even practicing their, their posture, you know, in a mirror or something like that. Uh, they can be really, really beneficial for the beginner player who doesn't have a good concept of the general movements of the swing. Because even if they have a really good understanding of the, say, club face and things like that, because their general body movements are, are basically, let's say, so inefficient and so lacking power and probably so uh, non-repeatable or so variable, they're probably not going to be able to achieve a very high proficiency of ball striking unless those, those global physical movements improve. Yeah. Do you agree with that as an instructor? Uh, yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. A part, part of the coaching methodology, methodology that I have at times is that particularly with someone who's starting off, I'd go through a series of rotation exercises, one full body, one hip turn. And uh, so I talk about the swing and the accuracy of the swing and then the body movements and trying to, over time, they combine together rather than trying to rush the whole lot of it. Yeah. Just keep the with, with a practice routine. So it's not so solely focused on the outcome of the golf ball. There'd be a good bit on the, the practice routine, which would be uh, body rotation exercises. We say a sets of five of those, uh, decent practice swings. So you, you get the feel for making a practice swing, hitting and finishing. And you can bundle more technical information into that activity, depending on where the person is. And then it can be more to do with the accuracy to take away with different types of drills to reinforce swing path or the yeah, yeah. swing path club club swinging away from the ball. So where the limitations then can come in, it's just something that I come across would be uh, people's uh, flexibility mm -hmm. and those types of exercise. So my, my, t my type of stuff is that I, I'd be recommending people to do general types of flexibility if you yeah. haven't got someone like you, for example. Yeah. Or uh, get into different, whether it's yoga, whether it's uh, resistance training. So I'd have an approach there where it's the golf swing, uh, the golf flexibility, 
and then some some and if you want to go further into it then is focus the mindset a bit more on what you'd yeah. like to do now that tends to be not so much something that comes up on the topic of conversation because that's that's really uh, if somebody's kind of into from their work perspective or their everyday perspective if they use mindset to help them with doing daily activities whether it's work or goals or whatever it might be then that's something that can be bundled into to start to talk about what would be what would be good mantras to talk about uh to help me perform better as a golfer overall. Now that's just just gone down a tangent there, right? But that's something that can yeah. can certainly be done. Um, but yes, I certainly would would certainly um, what you're talking about there for the different types of golfers. I I, I yeah. certainly would echo that as well. I come across that as well. Yeah. So kind of what you're saying there, I think we we basically agreed on the same sort of principles or ideas for the higher handicap player and the more beginner player they can get an awful, lot out of, an awful lot out of practicing these, let's just call them basic global body movements without a golf ball. They can improve their golf swing and their ball striking by doing these things, practicing rotations at home, even simple things like practicing balance, throwing some weighted balls or even, you know, side tossing a basketball or a soccer ball off a wall. But on the flip side, if you have a scratch handicap or a professional golfer, they already are doing that stuff really well. And because they've done it so many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of times, their, their technique or their, the kind of fancy term for it is their motor pattern that they've learned is not going to be changed when they go and hit a ball from the practice they've been doing with a broom handle or a medicine ball or a cable because they've become so finely tuned at the movements they do when the golf ball is there. So I don't think you're going to get a huge change in, and, and also they're already probably really good at it, but where you're likely to see, and this is where it goes way outside my kind of level of say expertise and comfort for helping golfers improve at their say ball striking. Like if you consider, let's just say one of the tour players that I work with, they're not going to be getting much improvement in terms of, say, ball striking from the basic global body movements that the 18 handicapper needs. They're going to be looking at really precise, like club face control things yeah. and, yeah. and path control things. Like, and to be honest, where, where most of the improvement or a lot of the improvement comes from in these players is, and this is why it goes back to, again, the... A uh, high handicap player can benefit from these like golf type moves in the gym where they're just practicing their rotation and their balance and their setup and things like this. When you go to the, and they'll probably see improvements in let's say club head speed and distance as well, just because they're moving in a more, more kind of efficient manner. They're using their body better. But when you go to the elite player, they're already going to have really, really good swings. It's going to be very, very fine adjustments. And there's also the potential of making them worse by trying to adjust something, which is seen all the time in players who are already at, say, the tour level. Yeah. But to be honest, most of the time, what they're looking for with their physical training, they don't have restrictions in mobility. Their balance is great. Their posture is great. But they might be saying, look, my club head speed is an average of 112 miles an hour. If I want to compete on, on all the golf courses throughout the year, I feel like I need to get up to 118. So what they're really looking for then is an increase in their horsepower. They need to improve muscle strength, maybe muscle size, muscle power. And that's a very, very different training program to the person who's an 18 handicapper who works 50 hours a week and just wants to kind of learn how to rotate, weight shift and balance. Yes. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. It's, yeah. I mean, I mean, the, 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 I, 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 the, the power question was rattling around in my head, but by the sounds of things that, <laughs> that looks like another half an hour conversation, which we should do. The, but, but yes, 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 it's very, very different types of activities there. Oh, 100%. Because, I mean, the, the better players I'd come across, the habits that they have are, are, are much more refined. It's, a, it's not that easy to adjust. Um, and a big part of the habits that I talk about for better players is trying to repeat the same type of habits as you do normally that you do well. 
Now, mm-hmm. that may be different than the Ben Hogan swing or the Ledbetter swing. There's all sorts of stuff that's different. But yeah. if you make a movement that's pretty good, that's unrestricted, and you get the clubs into different places and a good, decent club face and swing path impact, uh, you know, and you can do it uh, reasonably well. And if you have a particular type of system that you've kind of ingrained by default, certainly that would be something that I would be promoting to keep keep as much activity around that as much as you can. Now there may, I mean, because you come across different types of swings. I mean, um, I I just I'm just taking off the top of my head. I I, I came across a, a, a golfer there during the summer who had a who had a, who had a particular type of move when he was playing off uh, a five, and. And it was it was a shorter type of swing, and he kind of bunted it straight. And when he said bunted, he hit it. The ball flight wouldn't be what you'd call trackman esque, where uh-huh. it's a particular landing angle, any of that stuff. But it was really this, the hitting it was pretty good, and it was quite straight, and low but quite straight. And I, you know, I was asking questions how you manage the bounce and roll because with with that very low type of ball flight. It's going to bounce and roll quite a bit. Yeah. It's not. It's not something that's easily controlled. Where you have something that will drop down, and uh, so for him, he he he's familiar with, and it's a local knowledge thing where he's familiar with the course that he plays. He's familiar with where he needs to bounce it to get it close, and that was his game. So he 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 had some fantastic scores. We went from uh, he, he dropped down to three, in over I think it was. Uh, I think it was over the over the well from the first lesson. The next time I saw him was a month later, and he was down to three, wow. which which I thought was fantastic. And that was a lot of round too. He felt very comfortable with how he did what he did, um, very, and very and uh, as I say, it was very different to what you would call uh, symmetrically brilliant swing, where you have width, this, that, length of swing, and all the rest of it. And it, it just worked fine. So I was kind of saying, let's leave this alone, let's keep going. And there was no point in trying to reinvent the wheel for that particular type of person because it was working great. And um, you could come across people who would try and disassemble that and say, oh no, you need to do this, 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 and this, and it's a complete wrecker. Uh, yeah. it, and it, it maybe if even if I went back to at the start, there were, what do you play golf? Uh, what would you like to get out of golf? It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be, if it's a social thing, we all like to be good. We all like to perform well amongst our peers. And uh, we always like to take a few bob off the lads exactly, too. Exactly, yeah. The ladies, whichever, which one. And uh, I think, I think, and I, I suppose that's a very important thing as well to identify with what you play. And uh, because it's, it's a, I mean, I was, it, the, the, the level of competition and um, particularly at the, at the, let's say, squeezing down to around the scratch level, plus one, plus two, uh, competing for scratch cups and so forth, and competing for, let's say, a, even just around Ireland for the senior cup teams. There's a lot more players um, that are are trying to get on those teams. Whereas when I was when I was when I started playing golf first, like uh, they had maybe had five or six players, or going around to different clubs, you had a range of scratch to six or seven handicaps right now they're all pushed into a much yeah. much much more uh, more uh, more competitive field you know yeah i think probably some of that is is down to like definitely the improvements in equipment like i think there's no doubt that you know bigger drivers uh hybrids you know the 60 degree wedge like they've made a lot of the that what were i am assuming because i i that's how I learned to play golf was with all these things. But I assume golf was much tougher before those came in. But um, an interesting point there like that you brought up about in terms of, say, players who have already gotten quite good and they're trying to improve. I think the longer a player is playing and the better that they've got, like usually if someone has been playing a long time and they're also already a very low handicap, it's almost certain that they've spent an awful lot of time and done an awful lot of repetition hitting golf balls. So the kind of scope you have to change what they're doing is very limited, especially if they're already an adult and they don't have, you know, six hours a day to put into changing this motor pattern. Whereas if you have somebody who's just beginning and, and the risk of making them worse is also far greater, which is a legitimate concern. Yeah. For, for an already elite player. But yeah. if you have a beginner, you can basically do, you can, you can, sh- it doesn't really matter 
if they struggle a little bit at first, because likely what they're doing now is never going to get them to a you know reasonably proficient level. So you might as well kind of say, look, they're going to struggle with this for a while because it's different, but there's no way that what you're doing now is ever going to be you know decently good, basically. But the point I was going to make there when you brought up the elite level and we kind of talked about speed and power a little bit is like there's probably players there's probably a couple of players around the country. Or there might be more than a couple. There might be a couple in a lot of clubs who their consistency, and what I mean by consistency is how well they can repeat their action and how solidly they strike the golf ball might not be that far away from, let's say, tour level players. But the difference in the speed that the tour levels players club is moving and still having the same level of precision and consistency is markedly different. And what I mean by that is there's probably a good player in every club who's let's say 50 or 60 years old, who's been playing since they were 10. Let's say they've been scratched for 30 years and they, they pretty much flush every shot and you're playing with them and you're like, Jesus, this fella is class. Like every shot is, you know, out of the middle hits it lovely, but he's probably playing on a, let's, and let's just say he shoots even par most weeks in his local club. And I'm thinking of someone, as I say this, that used to be in the club that I uh, grew up in. And that's, that's what he was like. He used to just hit every shot really good, rarely hit it offline, always solid, but probably hit his driver, you know, let's say 250 and, you know, probably hit his like seven iron, let's say 150, which is great if you're, you know, playing on a 6,000 yard course, but the thing that happens with the elite level players is they have that consistency, but their drive is going 50 yards further. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're hitting a, a wedge from 150. And it just means that as the difficult, and what I mean, the point I'm making is that as you start getting elite, where you really, really see the differences between the elite and the sub elite is the courses start getting much harder. They start getting much longer and now all of a sudden the player who flushes the ball around his own course and shoots level par is trying to play on a course that's significantly longer. And the players who are really good at that level, they're just able to have the same level of precision while hitting the ball way further. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 and it is, I mean, I play with a couple of them and it is truly remarkable. The control and the speed, absolutely remarkable. I mean, I kind of look at it as uh, the, 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 and the coordination. And, you know, it's just some people can do that better than others. You can train it a bit, but they're just yeah, some people who are just better than others at it, you know? Yeah, it, it's, and it's, it, but it's, this, it's the same with like elite level players in, in every sport. Like there's, 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 let's say good, I know there's some amateurs who can compete with the top golfers at certain times, but when you watch world-class players hit golf balls, like it is quite different to what even, you know, a good club player does by good club player. If we say a zero or two handicap, like there yeah, is, a, it's, there it's is a, a big market difference, difference yeah, yeah, there is, in, there is, in there just, is. in just the strike. And yeah. the, kind of the point that I'm, I'm getting at though is players can get to, and it was a golf coach called Adam Young, who's a, a really, really interesting coach that I picked this up from. He said that if a player is able to put in a reasonable amount of practice and they have a reasonable amount of time to do it, you can get to a level where, like not everybody can do this, but there's no real reason why you can't get to a point where you're striking the ball very, very solidly and reasonably straight pretty consistently but what starts getting really really tough is if you're trying to get as good as you can the speed element is something that can't be ignored and it's as you start trying to make the body movements that allow you generate the really high speed is where now the being able to do it very precisely and very consistently gets very difficult it's one of the reasons why if you get let's just say a good player it's not that difficult, even for a mid handicap player, if you give them a 54 degree wedge and you give them a basket of golf balls and you want them to, let's just say, pitch it 50 yards through the air, 
Yeah. There's loads of players who can do that and they might not miss hit a ball out of 50 balls because the body motion that they need to use doesn't require enough complex movement or enough speed to make that difficult to do consistently. But now if you hand them a driver or a five iron, which is a much longer club, it requires way more speed. And they're all, and you also need to tell them like this ball has to carry the bunker at 250 yards. Well, that's when things start getting really, really difficult. And I think that's what separates, you know, the, the real kind of elite player from the good club player as such. Like they're better at everything, of yeah. course. But one of the big ones is being able to have the precision and, and skill of, you know, centeredness of strike and the repeatability at 115 or 120 miles an hour like that is so extremely hard whereas the good club player might be doing it at a 95 mile per hour or 90 mile an hour yeah um that's that's a and and that's that's a really interesting point there because i mean what you're getting into what we're talking about i suppose what we could start talking about there would be the effect that bryson dechambeau has had on the pga tour from the last lockdown and then winning in um uh, in Wing, Wingfoot, yeah, and, and and that type of and it, look, it was his day, and he, everything went well, perfectly, and it, it just became a massive thing. But at the same time, uh, his club speed speed, how far he, he hit it, was extraordinary. And um, so, what I would suge- suggest there, Mike, if that maybe, if you wouldn't mind, is that uh, we could talk again about that because I think we could certainly go on for another half an hour talking about uh, or half an hour or more talking about Bryce about speed uh, applying it and how the body then would need to be let's say customized or maintained or worked on to help with improving that speed because I, I've looked at different things and I've seen people do different things and I, I, I'm really interested to know more about it or talk more about it because a lot of it is that they, I, I, I suppose it's in summary is that you can come across people that's that talk about a lot about the theory, but whether that's applied and their experience from applying that theory, what that outcomes, what those outcomes are. Um, what would you think yeah. about that next week or the week after? We'd have another chat about. Oh that. yeah, yeah. No, I'd be I'd be happy to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, no worries. Excellent. So, if I was to, to sign off and say, um, Mike, thank you very much for your time. It was hugely interesting. I found it very beneficial talking about uh, uh, the body movements with, uh, within the swing, and and certainly the, the information around between what would be beneficial for golfers who are starting off and the differences between, let's say, someone at, at the elite level, um, where trying to get marge, where, where the big gains would be made in the gym that you could bring to the practice ground and vice versa uh definitely i think that's fantastic that was excellent um other than that mike to get in contact with you if people were listening to this and wanted to get in contact with you i think you have an app or sorry, i think you've i know of you an app uh is that app uh, where would be or which platform would you use social media platform would you use more often we could people we could... so for for the for the app the the way just so people don't uh, don't go to the app store is the only way to get the app is through my website which is uh, fitforgolf.blog there's a contact form on that if anyone wants to send an email basically they can just fill that out and the email will come through to me um, and then I am on Twitter mostly uh, for social media which is fit underscore for underscore golf um, Probably the best way is email, either that contact form or the email address is fitforgolf, the digits, uh, 18 at gmail.com. So fitforgolf18 at gmail.com. Super. What I'll do is that I'll, I'll put all that information as well underneath the clip as well. Under, and uh, it, it'll be there for uh, also me, uh, for people to click on and uh, get in contact with you. Mike, super. Listen, uh, Thanks happy. A lot, John. it's the 12th of January, which you wouldn't know this. It's my birthday. <laughs> happy oh, birthday, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, uh, Thank you. Uh, I, f- I feel sorry for you talking to me on your birthday. There's there's loads of better things you could be doing. Mike, I've nowhere to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I've nothing to do. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, listen, on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed.
Yeah, thanks a lot, John. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for, uh, for the call.